sake of it, it's going to be really good. And we're going to jump in today to a pretty hard word. If you're looking at that line, you're like, oh, yeah. Um, this series, Rumble Strips, has not been easy. If you hadn't been with us, we started off talking about lust, which is not an easy topic to talk about. Uh, we, we looked in the Old Testament story. It's one of the weirdest, hardest stories in the Old Testament. Um, but it's a good one when talking about, talking about just the difference between love and lust and how this corrupts marriage, how it corrupts relationships. And so go back and see that's from. But, but everything in Rumble Strips, to me, it kind of starts with, am I going to be someone consumed by lust? And that's a getting thing, remember? Or am I going to be someone that's going to live my life out in love and love is a giving thing? And that's the difference. That's like, like lust is me getting and love is me giving of myself. Um, last week we talked about making sure that marriage doesn't become, again, that thing you lust after, like that God thing. And Because when you do, you compromise. Today, um, this is a message for all of us. And it's not directly about, um, you know, singleness and dating and marriage, but it is about how we view relationships. And we need to make sure that we know the truth and what God intends for our relationships. And so let's dive into his word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting with verse 2. This is kind of an, an opener for me, uh, just to pump myself up, but I hope it'll pump you up too, because we're talking about something that we need to be pumped up sometimes to face it in our culture. It says, preach the word. I love that. Paul's talking to his protege. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince and rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and with teaching, because the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they, and that's meaning us, that's meaning our culture, that's meaning our world, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they'll turn their ears away from the truth and they'll be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. You endure afflictions. You do the work of an evangelist. You fulfill your ministry. Now, some of you are like, man, that's a good message to a sermon, uh, to, a, to a pastor. That's a good, like, I want to say that's a good message to you. Like, this is to the church. Like, to the church, we are the bearers of truth. We are the bearers of light. We are the bearers of the gospel. We are the thing, we are the change agent for the world, and there is no plan B. Like, again, if you want to know something about God, like, God, God is the most, like, we, we, we talk about faith and us being faithful to him, can you imagine the faithfulness that he has placed towards us? He has chosen us to be the bearers of the salvation of the world. He doesn't need us. He could write it out in the sky. He could appear to people just like he did in the Old Testament. He could find a multitude of better ways to show the world that he exists, that he loves, and that he saves. But he's chosen you, and he's chosen me. And if you need a reason to get up on a Monday morning, that's the reason you get up on a Monday morning. Not to go to your job, although I hope you love your job, and I know some of you don't. I hope you love it, but I know some of you don't. You don't get up for your job. You don't get up. I know most of you, you say, yeah, I absolutely love my kids. I love my kids, but I don't love them at 6 o'clock in the morning because they're, they're a different species. I mean, just being real with you. Like, like, like I hope you love your kids, but like, you don't get up for your kids. Like, I hope you love your kids. What we get up for, the thing that I want to move our life, this week you have a chance to do something spiritually significant in somebody else's life. And like, I just... To, to take a second and think about that. If you miss that, you've missed everything that matters this week. Like you can have the hardest week, and I hope you don't. Like I, I'm not speaking this over you. I'll be praying for you. Like you can have the hardest week at work where every circumstance is not going your way. But if you're, if you're able in the midst of that to love on someone or pray for someone, it's a good week at work. You and your wife can be having such tension this week, but if somehow in the midst of it you take your tension and you turn it towards your Savior... Like, it, it can be a really good week for your marriage. Your kids, they might become, my, my, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell on my kids just a little bit. Um, my, you know, my youngers, too, they're in elementary school. In elementary school, you get colors. I don't know if any of you remember those days or in the midst of those days, but you get colors on, based on your behavior. Now, my older two, I'm proud to say, um, to my knowledge, there were very, very few colors other than good colors. Green and then and, and kind of on that side of the spectrum are good. When you start edging towards red, it gets bad. All, my other two, green, green all, all the way. The twins, it just depends on the day. It just depends on the day. They're just as likely to be on orange or red as they are to be on green, purple, or pink, which are good, good colors. I haven't, but like whether or not they're winning there or not, don't, that isn't the determination of your week. Like in the midst of even them losing, it gives me and my wife, we have lots of conversation with their teacher in the name of Jesus. Like, <laughs> we can, I want us to live a life. That, that is the real life. And so as we dive into the topic today on sexuality and on gender identity, again, the, the two things, and it's important that we stay in, in the center of God's will. As we stay on the, like, 
I want us to understand that we have been given and entrusted with this incredible mission, and we have to take it so seriously. So let's dive in to the topic for today. Um, guys, if you want to, first point of the day, the, the road that God has paved in regard to sexual identity, there's two rumble strips to help keep us on track, and those two rumble strips are truth and grace. So remember, rumble strips are those things on the edge of the road, sometimes they're even carved in the middle of the road, and they help you stay in the right lane so that you don't go off the road or so you don't cross over the center line. Like, like the purpose of rumble strips is not to make your ride bumpy and to ruin it. The purpose of rumble strips is that if you start to get off track, it puts you back on track so you actually get to where you're going. And, and we believe that for people to actually get to where they're going with God, they have to recognize when, when they hit rumble strips that they can wake up and turn back to the right track. As we talk about this, this topic, let's just get real for a second. Like, Jason, you've already been real for the entire time you've been up there, okay? Like, like every family now is touched by this. Every, every, all of us have a friend. We all have a family member. We all have somebody we know that is dealing with these issues. Some of you in this room, you might be dealing with these issues and you feel like church is the last place you can talk about it. We want church to be the first place we can talk about it because we want you to know that whatever you're dealing with, our God is love and our God is good and our God is mercy and his people, we're trying to be representatives of that. So we're not gonna always say what you like to hear if you're dealing with any particular sin, but we're gonna love you no matter what you're dealing with, any particular sin, okay? So to start us off, we're gonna... Start off with truth. We have to. The truth is a foundation. We have to begin with truth. So let's do some truth. And again, some of you, this is going to be real easy. You just naturally say amen to this. Others of you, this is going to be harder. And that's okay. But here's the truth. Here's the truth. We can't call lifestyle what God calls sin. And it's just the truth. And I don't say that to hurt anybody. I don't say that to frustrate anybody. I don't say that to judge anybody. I'm just giving you the truth that, that when, when the word of God says something is wrong, no matter how we want to wrap it up, no matter what excuse or justification we want to give it, we can't call something that he calls sin anything else. And it doesn't matter. It, and I'm about, I'm about to go from preaching in the mail in a little bit, but like, it doesn't matter who, who disagrees. It doesn't matter if Oprah Winfrey disagrees, y'all. It doesn't matter if Ellen DeGeneres disagrees, y'all. It doesn't matter if your favorite TV show has the most amazing you know, same-sex couple and they disagree, y'all. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, okay? Like, we have to use the word of God as the basis of our truth. Not, as a point, not to point a finger and not to look down our nose, but to look with love and realize we're all broken by something. We're all wrong about something and we all need Jesus to come in and make us right. And so when we talk the truth, I'm gonna give us an Old Testament and a New Testament. There's a lot here, so I'm just gonna read both for you and then we'll talk a little bit about it. So the Old Testament, like, so it's, it's always been the truth. This isn't like a new thing. It's always been a thing. Leviticus 18 is a very popular Old Testament passage. And guys, I've done lots of study on this topic. Um, and so let's dive in. I'll talk to you a little bit about it. It says, moreover, I, and I chose to give you the section I did for, with a reason. Moreover, you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. So it's just talking about sexual sin at this point. And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech. And so it's talking about false worship. And then you shall not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And so this section in this Old Testament passage is, is where Moses is laying out in the people of God some of the baseline moral behaviors in which he wants them to live. And then he says in verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Um, and I, I told you I've, I've studied this, and I actually mean that. Like I've, I've very deeply studied this. For those of you who don't, don't know, a lot of you probably do. And I, I went to Chapel Hill for my undergrad. The, if you're wondering like why, um, my dad was always a fan, a Tar Hill fan, but... Uh, the other reason is, and some of you, I've told you this story too, but like my dad always believed that if my faith was real and my calling was real, I could go, I could go to the most liberal school available and it would, my calling would stay real and my faith would stay real. And when we looked at the most, what is the most liberal school in North Carolina? Chapel Hill was it. Like, and, and, and I say that as an alum, <laughs> I say that as a fan, but if you don't know, Chapel Hill it culturally is about as far from conservative Christian faith as you possibly can get. It's extremely, extremely liberal. And, and yeah, man, and there, wasn't a, there wasn't a classroom that I was in that there wasn't a same-sex couple in, in there. I mean, I worked at Walden Books because before there was Barnes & Nobles, there was this little place in the mall called Walden Books. And a guy that I spent a lot of time taking out the trash with because and, and, that was my first little, little job, he, he was in the same place. Like, I was surrounded with people dealing with this issue, this little Baptist boy coming out of a Southern Baptist church. I, I, to my knowledge, in Beargrass, I'd never met 
a same-sex individual. And now, again, everywhere I turn, people are in these relationships. And now I have to figure out what to do with it. And when you look at this particular passage, some people want to say that this passage is referring to rape. Um, and it was an ancient practice um, that if a military conquered another military, there were, there were some cultures that would, would rape the, the conquered soldiers as a sign of dominance. The, the, and and I've, I met a lot of Christian same-sex individuals, people who, are, you know, they, they believe in the same God we do. They want, them, they want it to be okay, and they, they try to explain away this passage by saying, oh, this isn't about consensual relationships. This is about rape. The problem with that is, is that in the Old Testament, the Bible specifically talks about rape. It, say, it, it says the words rape. Like that is a, that's a, there's a Hebrew word for that. And it's not mentioned here. What is mentioned here is that if any man lies with another man in the same way that he should lie with his wife, that is against the will of God. It's an abomination. And I know that's a strong word. Again, not trying to judge this sin more harshly than others. Our sin is an abomination. One of the problems that, that I have and that you have is that we view our sin too lightly and we view our God too lightly so often. But it's always been against God's heart. And as we go into a season of grace, we're saying, okay, well, God was a God of judgment in the Old Testament, but the New Testament is about love and grace. The power of Jesus forgives everything. And yes, it does. But if we're trying to walk, again, between the rumble strips and his wheel, the New Testament says this. 1 Corinthians, one of a couple passages I could have chosen. 1 Corinthians 11, 13 through 16. It says, judge, judge among yourselves. Is it, oh, sorry, y'all. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, I started with the wrong passage. Went, went ahead one. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And, and, and I think we need to emphasize that. In our culture, in our generation, don't, don't be deceived. Like, understand that, again, our God is a God of grace and mercy and love, but we're still called to live walking in his will in between the rumble strips. It says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, not revilers or extortioners. None of them will inherit the kingdom of God. And so Paul gives this list not to pick on any particular sin, but to remind all of us that we all need grace. Because if you don't think you're on that list somewhere in some form, you're probably lying a little bit to yourself. And some of you are like, well, I've never dealt with sexual sin. Yeah, but you might have, for instance, dealt with being covetous towards someone. You, maybe you've never been a drunkard, and yet at the same time, perhaps you've been a reviler of another. That's basically a reviler, the biblical word for being a judger or a gossiper of others. Like, he's trying to be comprehensive, saying, we need Jesus. We need forgiveness. And in verse 11, he says, it's such for some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And so when we look at the truth, the truth is, the truth is, we can't say something's okay when the Bible says it's not. And that, that's, that's one of the problems with the LGBTQ movement. Like the, like that, the, the movement, that, as far as in the relationship with the church, um, it, they want to somehow get the church to say that what they're doing and the lifestyle they're living is not wrong. And for any of you that are a part of that community, because we, we have people that are in the LGBTQ community that come to Ignite, and, and we love that. I, and I want them to come, and I want them to invite all their friends, and I want all of them, I want all of you to discover Jesus, and I want all of you, of course, as you study his word, to let the Holy Spirit, like, I, my sermons aren't going to change anybody's behaviors, but the Holy Spirit will. Someone say amen to that, please. Like, that, that's what has to change you. I'm not in the business of of my sermons changing anyone. I just speak truth and the Holy Spirit changes people. Like our church is welcoming to the LGBTQ community, but we're gonna tell them the truth that we believe out of, out of the word. And, and in this passage, again, this is a passage that, that a lot of Christian theologians who have dealt with same-sex issues, they try to write off as, as well, it doesn't mean what, what we think that it means. And man, again, I've studied it. Now, there, there are two, two references to same-sex relationships in this passage. You know, one is the English homosexual. And guys, that one, that Greek word is, is pretty doggone clear. It's pretty clear that it's, it's there, there was a Greek word for homosexuality. Homosexual relationships were very common in Greek culture, um, as a matter of fact. Um, but the second word is a word that is, is nowhere else in the Bible, and it's nowhere else in ancient Greek. And most people believe that Paul made it up, and I probably actually agree with that. The word for sodomite there, what that actual word means is it means a soft man. And I believe what, what Paul is trying to say is that whether you are the dominant force in a same-sex relationship or whether you're more of the receptive force in a same-sex relationship, he said, either one is wrong. Either one is wrong. 
Like, it, like to, to think that either one is okay, no, no. They're both against the will of God. Now, they're not more against the will of God than my sin or your sin. But we can't say that it's not sin. So number one, we can't call off that what God calls sin. Number two, guys, and this one is the biggest one for me. If you guys would leave with this, man, you, you've left with the truth. The issue is more about identity than sexuality. The, 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 the issue, whether it's about same-sex relationships or whether it's about gender identity. In other words, people having a choice to decide whether they identify as male, female, or none of the above. If you've ever filled out an online survey recently, you see all those options. <laughs> like, it, okay, like the issue about that, yeah, it really is. It's an identity issue. It's an identity issue more than it is a sex issue, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Let me read your passages, and I'll do a better job going through them quick. Man, this is just so much I want you to know about this topic because it's just so prevalent in our culture. Starting with Old Testament, Deuteronomy 22, it says, "You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fall down along the road and hide yourself from them." Help him. Help him to lift it up. And so again, he's talking about general moral behavior. This is how we live. We're going to help each other. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, and a man shall not put on a woman's garment for all who do so. They're an abomination to their God. And guys, understand this rightly. Paul, it's like in the Old Testament, there's not, it's not about clothing. It's about presentation of identity. There were certain ways that men would dress that identified them as man. Again, in ancient Israel, both men and women covered up a lot more of themselves than we do today. So you couldn't tell, especially at any amount of distance, whether a guy was a guy or a girl was a girl without certain identifying features because they covered themselves a lot. So he's like, hey, for a, for a woman to choose to look like a man, for a man to choose to look like a woman and, and somehow bring about a false identity to make the world believe that there's something other than what God designed them to be, that, that's not okay. You see, the truth is, and we'll pick on me because let's just get real. I'm five foot five. I can't grow a beard to save my life, which, by the way, we have some amazing beards at Ignite, and I hate all you guys that can grow them. Like, okay, man, this is some cool. Like, it's, so, it's, so in, it's so in style now to have, like, the longer beard, and I just, I, I got, like, one hair. Like, you know, they go, so sad, so pathetic. Anyway, um, I... Like, I'm not saying that I'm pretty, but I've been accused of that in my past. Like, I, okay, as pretty as I am, some of you are like, you're not that pretty. Amen. I agree. But like, there's, there's no makeup I could put on. There's no dress that I could wear. If you're wondering if I've ever rocked heels, I have, and I rocked them, man. My calves looked amazing, okay? Like, the, the heels I put on. Nothing will ever change the reality that on my chromosomal level, I'm an X and I'm a Y. I'm a man. I'm a man. There's no surgery that I can have. There's no, there's no title, Mr. Mrs. whatever, that I can give myself to change the reality of how God made me. To say, that, to say that God mistaked my identity sexually means that God made a mistake in his creation of me. And, and it's so interesting, and I, look, I'm, if you're part of that, again, the, the community, I'm not trying to pick on the community, but I am trying to bring truth. Like, the community talks all the time about, well, I got to be who God made me to be. And I say, amen to that. Amen to that. You got to be who God made you to be. And he, and, he, and he didn't make a mistake in your gender. He didn't make a mistake in, 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 in the desire for relationship that he made you to be. And I know that all of us are tempted. I mean, if, if I lived out my temptations, I've already talked about them in the previous sermons in this series. If I lived out my temptations, Jessica would not be my only one. Is that what God made me to be or is that what I made me to be? And all of us like, well, that's not right, Jason. Well, who are you to judge what I do and be right? That's what God made me to be. You see the slippery slope we go on. We have to be careful. And again, there, there are things about me and there are things about God's word and things about God's law that if I was God, I'd, ch I'd change. <laughs> but guess what? I'm not. And everybody says amen to that. <laughs> Whew, thank you. You are so lucky I'm not because I'd mess this. This world would be broken if it was up to me. And you're not. And we're... We're not. First Corinthians 11, it says, Judge among yourselves, is it proper for a man to pray to God with, is it, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her hair uncovered? Because that was a cultural thing that, again, signified womanhood. Does even nature itself tell you if a man has long hair, it's just honoring him, because it, it was a cultural thing, like that was something that women did. If a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her. Her hair is given as a covering. If anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom 
nor the churches of God. Again, it's not about hairstyles, y'all. Please don't get distracted by the hairstyles. Uh, that's not what Paul's talking about. Like, my sisters, like, if you're wearing a hat, cool. And if you're not, you're just as beautiful with one, without one as with one. You know, there was a day when women wore hats because of this verse. You had to have your head covered. No, it's not about you having your head covered. It's about a woman being a woman. Men. Man, some of you rock the coolest ponytails I've ever seen. That's fine. Like, it's okay. You don't have to go to the barber and get it shaved off. Um, I don't know about the samurai bun on top, though. I don't know about that. I'm still, I'm still praying. I'm still praying about that one. I don't know if that's okay or not. Like, it's not about hair. Paul's talking about identity. And he just, he's reminding the church that it's so important for us to identify. You are a son of God or a daughter of God first. Before any other title that you may take on, that's who you are. And so when we're talking about someone who, who it, you know, they define themselves by their sexuality. They, they, they consider themselves a part of the LGBT, LGBTQ community. What they're kind of doing, I, I think sometimes, is they're putting that community in front of their faith. So they're an LGBTQ Christian. But they're supposed to be a Christian first. You're supposed to be a Christian first. And, and, and I'll, again, not people like, yeah, be a dad, but be a Christian and dad. Be a mom, be a Christian mom. Be a husband, be a Christian husband. Be, like, be a friend, be a Christian. Like, Christ is first. And if he's first, then he guides everything else. He guides everything else. And, and so we need to make sure that we keep the truth. The truth is what I desire for all of my brothers that are part of that community is that they, would, that they would see and find their identity in Jesus first. And then, again, if they did, if that happens, if that happens with us, everything else will change in the right way. So we talked a little about truth. Let's talk about grace, too, because we have to have both. If we just have truth, we can make a point, but we can't make a difference. We can be a Pharisee, and no one will ever want to be, be with us or change by us. We have to have grace. And here's grace, and, and this, is, this is what we take away. We're going we're gonna to love like Jesus did. Knowing the truth of individuals who deal with this and knowing the truth that we're going to go to work and people in our office deal with this. We're going to go to school and people in our school deal with this. We're going to have family members that deal with this. Knowing the truth, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to start with love. We're going to start with love. Just like Jesus did. In John 8, I give you a familiar story to many of you. I love this story. I've talked about it several times. It's, it's when Jesus was kind of being brought to him, this woman who was caught in the midst of adultery. So, again, it's about sexual sin. This woman is, is in the middle of sexual sin. And it, for the Israelites, remember, if you were committing adultery, the penalty for adultery was you would be stoned to death. That's what God said in their culture. You'd be stoned to death for doing that. So they bring this woman, cast her down at the feet of Jesus. She's being, she, we caught her in the middle of adultery. Is she innocent or is she guilty? So they're trying to ask Jesus, what do we do with her? And look at what Jesus says. In John 8, 7, he says, So when they continued asking him, Jesus raised himself up and he said to them, Well, he who has no sin among you, let him throw a stone first at her. And again, Jesus stooped down, he rolled on the ground. Those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, they went out one by one, beginning with the oldest because they're the smartest and the wisest, <laughs> even to the last. And Jesus was left alone when the woman was there in his midst. And Jesus raised himself up and he saw no one but the woman. So he said to her, woman, well, where are the accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, man, this is such a powerful story. Because there's a couple things that, that Jesus did not do. I want to share with you really quickly. Jesus did not say that her sin was okay. He did not say that her sin was not a sin. He never denied it. This woman was guilty. And everybody knew she was guilty. And Jesus knew she was guilty. And what did she deserve? Death. What does our sin deserve? Death. Like, he never denied her guilt or what she deserved. What he did instead was he loved her. And so he said, well, she deserves death. Yeah, you guys, if you throw a stone at her, you are doing the right thing. Not the wrong thing. You're doing the right thing. But, but, if you throw a stone at her, you really need to throw one at yourself too, right? So he said, if, hey, anybody who doesn't have sin, y'all can go ahead and start stoning her. Otherwise, we're all going to be dead. That's what we deserve. Just, let's just all get rocks and throw them at each other. And people walked away. And then when, she, when, when he has that moment with her where, you know, he says, hey, where are your accusers? Well, they're gone. And he's like, well, I don't condemn you either. He didn't say. She didn't, it's like, you sinned, but I don't condemn you for your sin. I don't judge you for your sin. And then he says, but, don't, but go and sin no more. 
Go and live in a way that's righteous to God. And so for anyone that's a part of that community or any, or dealing with any sexual sin or any other sin, we want you to know, like, we love you. We do not condemn you. But what's the message that we speak to you? Go and sin no more. Know that our God is love. Know that our God is forgiveness. Know that he is grace. Know that he is light. Know that he is life. Go and sin no more. If you've ever been out to the new student center at ECU, um, you might have noticed that right in the, guys, it's right in the middle, right in the center of the new student center at ECU um, is the Jesse Peel LGBTQ, um, I don't know if it's library, museum, or, or, or space. Um, and I know Jesse Peel very, very well, Dr. Jesse Peel. Um, weird enough, uh, I was pastor at Everett's Baptist Church before starting at night, and um, Mr. Jesse's mama was a part of my congregation. And I got to know Mr. Jesse extremely well. And I got to, 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 to know, I mean, like, talk, I mean, truly, close relationship. This, this guy for the past 15 years has sent me uh, Christmas ornaments and stayed in contact with me. Like, we have a close relationship. Um, we disagree strongly on this issue. And I love him anyway, and he loves me anyway. And he's convinced that I'm going to go in heaven and find out I was wrong. And I'm, I'm, I'm praying that, you know, we see each other in heaven, and it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. Can we say amen to that? It doesn't matter who's right or wrong. Like, I, just, like, I love him. I love him. Um, he invited me to the opening of the student center because he got, some, he got like an exclusive thing because he gave a lot of money. <laughs> That's why his old picture is up there, if you've ever been in there. And uh, as a part of the little presentation for the space, he had all these students that were part of the community come and, and talk about what the community meant to them, all these students and my wife, she's going to be at second service, and she'll be the verified. Like, I, I, was we, I was weeping when I was listening to them because what these students were saying, guys, this is what they were saying. So, so you know this community. What they were saying is that everyone hated them, and they were so thankful they had a place where they could be loved. Everyone rejected them. Their families rejected them. Their friends, you know, once middle school happened and, and things started, you know, identity again becomes real important and sexuality becomes really important. Like, people, like their stories... Every single story was a story of rejection, and, and I was crying, and my wife said, why are you crying? I was like, because the church is supposed to be that, not the LGBT center. Like, like we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be the ones that loved them. We were supposed to be the ones that accepted them. We were supposed to be the ones that actually cared enough about who they were eternally that we weren't worried about getting cooties from them or whatever. You know, whatever weird thing we think, it broke my heart because, yeah, what they were most hungry for is just for someone to tell them that somebody loved them and was there for them and would be there for them no matter what. And that's what we are, right? That's what we are. And so it starts with love. So some of you, you need to make a phone call to somebody today. I'm calling you out today. Because ever since you found out about their identity or their sexuality, you just stopped talking to them. Because <laughs> you feel like it's easier just to not talk to them than to have a disagreement with them. And I'm just saying, just call them and love them and care about their life. And if they ask you to affirm what they believe, you can't do that. But you affirm them. You love them. It starts with love. And then number two, guys, and I'm done with you today. We're going to speak because we care. We're going to speak because we care. We don't just love. We don't just love. We do have to speak. And it's not because we judge. It's because... We care. One of the most scary scriptures in all the Bible. But I want us to, to have it. Because again, we, we, we come in contact with people who are wrestling with this and so many other issues. And we just need to have the boldness to love them enough to speak. Ezekiel 33. It says, if the watchman, if the watchman sees a sword coming. In other words, like the, if you're part, if part of it, not if you're visiting, like, we want you to know, like, yeah, we believe in a God of grace and mercy. But we also believe there is a judgment. We don't, we don't believe in a universal heaven. We believe that the only pathway to heaven is to know and trust and, 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 and try to, and we're going to do this so imperfectly, and try to follow after Jesus. Like, he is our salvation. So we see the sword coming, and we don't blow the trumpet, and people aren't warned. If the sword comes and takes a person from among them, they're taken by, it says, he's taken by his iniquity. So what that is saying is like, hey, understand this. We aren't responsible for other people's sin. They are. But if we see judgment coming, if we see the, the, what, what's going on and we don't say anything, this last part is but their blood. I require that at the watchman's hand. Do you know who you are at night, church? 
Yeah, we're the watchmen of the world. We're, we're, we're the bearers of truth. And we, we don't do that to lord over the world. No, we're servants of the world. We serve the entire world. And we love people enough to tell them the truth even when it's hard. We love them enough to, to inject ourselves into their situation and try, to, and try to bring Jesus into their life because we know it will change everything. The shirt I'm wearing today is our baptismal shirt. Jesus in my place. And that's what it's all about. And so, again, if anybody heard judgment or condemnation today, I just want you to know, like, man, I've been such a sinner in my life. I don't have any condemnation left for anybody else. I'm the condemned one. Like, like but if you're struggling in sin and I see you, if we as a church are, are seeing someone, we're going to tell you the truth. Because we know a Jesus that can pull us out of sin and shame and he can give us spirituality. He can give us purpose. He can give us life. And that's what we want for the world. We want life for them. So if you're here, some of you are here like, yeah, this this issue is an issue you're dealing with. But you're wondering, does God love me? Does God care about my life? And I just want you to know, he loves you. He's already forgiven you for everything you've ever done or ever will do by the power of his, of his son named Jesus. And all that he wants is for you to turn and look upon him, for you to turn and pursue him. So let's pray that, that we would receive that love and that we would be bearers of it because the world needs it. Heavenly Father, oh, man, there's one sermon on this is not enough. Some people probably, it's more than enough, but it's not enough, Jesus. This thing is so real. It's, it's so real. It's all around us. And we, we can, the church, we can seem so condemning. We can seem so judgy. We can feel so angry. And yeah, I condemn Satan and the fact that he tries to twist up everything good that you give God, including our sexuality. Yeah, I judge. I judge every demonic force that's trying to, to, to cause people to find their identity in anything else other than Jesus, the maker of their life, the, the author of their salvation. Yeah. Father, let us condemn the right things and let us be bearers of love and truth to a world that needs it. And if there's someone here that, that they need love and they need truth, Father, right now, let them know you love them. You love them right now. It doesn't matter what they've been through, what they're doing. You love them. And you want to transform them forever. You want to make them like you. Not because they're bad, but because they're broken. You are the healer and redeemer and restorer of every broken thing. And so, Father, let us be, let us be who you made us to be. Let us live how you called us to live. And we celebrate the fact that Jesus stood in our place and he changed everything.